there are a number of different adaptations that occur in terms of the amount of oxygen that could be carried in the blood by hemoglobin and the interactions between carbon dioxide and hemoglobin and oxygen that allow more oxygen to be delivered to the tissues such that at altitude, you can function just normally. But if you then move very quickly from altitude, say you've been training at 8,000 feet or 10,000 feet, you've been hiking up at the high level and you've adapted and you come down to sea level, well, for about two to five days, you're gonna feel like an absolute beast. You're going to be able to essentially deliver far more oxygen to your muscles per breath. In part, that is because of the way that the hemoglobin and the oxygen that it's carrying has been altered when you were at high altitude, but it's also because when you were at that high altitude, those intracostal muscles and those diaphragms got trained up quite a bit and allowed you to generate more air volume for every breath. In other words, those muscles got stronger and you got more efficient at driving the phrenic nerve consciously to really breathe in a lot of oxygen so you don't feel lightheaded, headache, et cetera. Okay, so that's a little bit of an aside, but it's an important aside, I believe, because A, it answers a question a lot of people ask and that a lot of people wonder about, and B, because it incorporates both the mechanical aspects of breathing and the chemical aspects of breathing. I realize it's a little bit of an unusual circumstance, but now if anyone asks you why it's hard to breathe at altitude, you know it has to do with this lack of a high pressure to low pressure gradient um, across the body and with the, the atmosphere outside you. It's also an opportunity for me to say that if you do find yourself at altitude and you have a headache or you're feeling like you just can't catch your breath, spending some time really consciously trying to draw in larger breaths of air as much as that might seem fatiguing and you'll be short of breath, it will allow you to adapt more quickly. And a little bit later in the episode, we'll touch on a few methods, including deliberate hyperventilation, combined with some breath holds that can allow you to deliver more oxygen to the cells immediately upon arriving at altitude so you don't get quite as much headache, disorientation, and so on. So leaving breathing at altitude aside, let's all come back down to the same conceptual level. We can ask ourselves, for instance, what is healthy breathing and what is unhealthy breathing? And the first place we wanna tackle this is within the context of sleep. So when we go to sleep at night, we continue to breathe. That's no surprise. If we didn't, we would die during sleep. However, there is a large fraction of the population that under breathes during sleep. They're not taking deep enough or frequent enough breaths. And therefore they are experiencing what's called sleep apnea. They are becoming hypoxic hypoxic, there's less oxygen being brought into their system than is necessary. People that are carrying excess weight, either fat weight or muscle weight or both, are more prone to nighttime sleep apnea. However, there are a lot of people who are not overweight who also experience sleep apnea. How do you know if you're experiencing sleep apnea? Well, first of all, excessive daytime sleepiness and excessive daytime anxiety combined with daytime sleepiness is one sign that you might be suffering from sleep apnea. The other thing is if you happen to snore, it's very likely that you are experiencing sleep apnea. And I should mention that sleep apnea is a very serious health concern. It greatly increases the probability of a cardiovascular event, heart attack, stroke. It is a precursor or sometimes the direct cause of sexual dysfunction in males and females, cognitive dysfunction during the daytime. It can exacerbate the effects of dementia, whether or not it's age-related, dementia of the normal sort or Alzheimer's type dementia, which is an acceleration of age-related cognitive.